The League of Women Voters of Johnson County is a nonpartisan political organization founded in 1920 and dedicated to maintaining an informed electorate through education and advocacy. The local league is a member of the National League of Women Voters, consisting of 50 state leagues and 803 local chapters. And we also are a member of the Iowa League of Women Voters. As always, we are grateful for the partnership of the Iowa City Public Library, which includes their excellent technical services. Tonight's program is being live streamed and also recorded for on-demand, anytime access through the library's YouTube channel and the League's Facebook page. Um, I did not mention, in, there is information back there, but there is mention of, of um, an upcoming program next week, actually, which is being co-sponsored co by TRAIL that stands for Tools and Resources for Active Independent Living, the Iowa City Public Library, and the Johnson County League. So next Wednesday, November 1st, during the lunch hour, noon to 1, in this meeting room, Jean Donham will speak on public education for the public good, past, present, and future. Uh, this is a very important topic for the November 7 election where voters will choose among seven candidates to fill four seats on the Iowa City Community School District Board. So if you can, please try to attend this informative presentation. Um, also, I will add that the League's October 18 candidate forum in which six of the seven candidates participated is available for viewing on the League's Facebook page. And that um, league, the URL for that, is on a sheet of paper back there. So with that, I want to welcome to the podium Travis Wipert, Johnson County Auditor, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Travis. Good evening, everyone. Um, as mentioned, I'm Travis Wipert, Johnson County Auditor. It's kind of funny seeing the first slide why people don't vote. Uh, you can vote early right now at the Johnson County Auditor's Office, and we have satellites coming up. So just a quick kind of plug there that there's no reason not to get out and vote. So without further ado, uh, thank you and good evening. Uh, I want to introduce Caroline Talbert as a distinguished UNI prof University Professor of Political Science at the University of Iowa, where she has taught since 2006. Her title reflects the status she has achieved at the university and in her profession. In 2009, just three years after joining faculty, she received the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Collegiate Scholar Award, recognizing her exceptional achievement in both research and teaching. She regularly teaches graduate seminars in statistics and undergraduate courses in public policy and social media and politics. In addition to her teaching post, she also is a distinguished research fellow and senior faculty fellow with the University of Iowa Public Policy Center. Dr. Tolbert's scholarship includes nearly a dozen books, uh, including a 2001 book on the Iowa caucuses and scores of journal articles on elections and representation, voter turnout, and public opinion. Her prolific scholarship has brought many honors and awards, of which I will mention only the most recent. In 2002, she and two co-authors received the Goldsmith Book Prize for the best academic book, Choosing the Future, Technology and Opportunity in Communities from the Shorestein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard, excuse me, at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. In 2001, she was named one of 26 Andrew Carnegie Fellows for her research on voting and state election laws. In 2009, Political Science and Politics, a publication of American Political Science Association, ranked her among the top 40 women political scientists in the country. Among her recent books, she is co-author with Michael Ritter of Accessible Elections, How State Government Can Help Americans Vote, published in 2020. Their book examines absentee mail voting, early voting, and same-day registration. Tolbert and Ritter are currently completing a new book, Making Democracy Work, 
which develops a county level index benchmarking how well local governments conduct elections. Previous metrics were only available at our state level. Her research, often funded by the National Science uh, Foundation, nonprofits, and technology partners, seeks to, seeks to strengthen American democracy and partici participation in politics. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Caroline Tolbert, who will speak to us this evening on why people don't vote, dissatisfied voters, and the process of democracy. Please welcome Dr. Tolbert. That was a too kind introduction for those who know me. And I should say one thing is that we have um, incredible colleagues and graduate students at the University of Iowa, and they are our collaborators and our co-authors. So Michael Ritter is um, at Washington State University, but he is a former University of Iowa um, alumni. And without our alumni, and I mean, without our grad students and our alumni, we just wouldn't be able to do what we can do. So anyway, we're just lucky. Iowa is a lucky place. Um, so let me uh, walk you through a little bit real quickly. I have many slides with many maps. I'm going to move a little bit because I have to be able to see the screen. Um, but I just want to show you, we, this is something that um, we, can, we created, which is a county index of how well local governments conduct elections. We often focus a lot about election laws. Are there voter ID laws? Are they restrictive? We look at we look at laws in terms of morality policy in lots of areas, but we often don't kind of look at the capacity of governments to do their job. Um, we do this with hospitals. Notice we rate, we rate our hospitals like the 100 best hospitals. That's a lot of that is based on like the capacity of the staff to do a good job, to, to take care of patients in a hospital. In a similar way though, um, we care about how well governments can conduct elections, and it's called the Election Performance Index. I'm going to show you more about it. Um, and this is just showing a bivariate map of how high was turnout in the 2020 election and where are elections conducted the best, where do they have the highest scores. So in that top right corner, which is purple, those are places that had the highest voter turnout in 2020, counties and the highest um, capacity to conduct elections. Can you find Johnson County in there? Is it shaded dark purple? It should be. Okay, our, our goal is, our goal is for, for all counties to be dark purple. That's our goal. How do we get all of America to conduct elections as best as possible and have the highest possible turnout. If we could get to there, we might have an answer to how to make democracy work or how to make this country work better. I should just show you that places in pink um, conduct elections well but have lower turnout and places in teal have high turnout but the local governments don't conduct elections as well, at least on this metric. And you see a lot of Florida. You see, Florida has a lot of people who would vote but wouldn't necessarily. And, and gray, uh, the, the light pink or the, what color is that? Just beige. Beige means they're not doing well in terms of voter turnout or in this metric of conducting local elections. And that's kind of problematic because what kind of states are beige? They're big. That would be Texas, California, and New York. I think that's like where a huge percentage of the population lives. So anyway, we'll come back to this map, but the goal is we in Johnson County are purple. We're fortunate, and we're fortunate to you. And um, how do we get the rest of the country, and especially local governments, to not to get into that color shade? These are actually, I gave a talk at the law school during the pandemic, and this is just kind of a flashback. Let's flashback to when we had an election between Trump and Clinton. It's hard, it's hard to even flashback that far, but we did have that election in 2016. Um, and back then, Pew did a survey, 
And it actually showed that over 90% of people who ended up voting for Trump and Clinton felt that, that having free, that national elections that were open and fair was one of the most important things about America. Like free and fair elections. Not like in countries where you worry, oh, what happened with that election? What does that ballot mean? Who just took over? Um, and so to be a democratic citizen really is about being able the right to vote. Um, in fact, Thomas Jefferson believed that public education, we think of public education for economic opportunity. Thomas Jefferson thought of public education so you could have the right to vote, so you could be informed, so you could participate. Um, flashback again, this same time, now 2020, 83% um, of people said it was really important who won the presidency in 2020. This was Biden versus Trump in 2020. We are heading into 2024 faster than you can, faster than we know. And that's one of the things about studying elections, conducting elections, is it's always changing. It's not boring because the world is changing. Here we are. This is our beautiful um, Iowa River. But what this talk is going to do is build off from our accessible elections book that was published in 2020 with Michael Ritter. Um, and it's going to try to answer three questions. Are there a set of voting laws that have been shown to work and improve turnout? Just how important is quality local election administration? Something we don't often measure, something we only recently started to measure. And actually, Mitchell and Hale have a new measure, which they argue is superior to what we're showing here. Um, and then lastly, very quickly, I'm going to show you some research on can we encourage more civil campaigns and less polarization, more moderates, by giving people more choice. Not less choice, but more choice. Um, we have two parties in this country for 330 million people. It's not very many choices. If you had to be asked only two choices to every night for dinner, pizza or las what? Pizza and lasagna? I don't know. You'd get tired of your two choices if that's all you had was two choices. Um, I think this is a repeat, the first bullet, but the second just basically says that the majority of U.S. election policy is at, actually made at the state and local level. So you have a lot of power. He has a lot of power right here. Um, every year, thousands of bills related to voting and elections are introduced in state legislatures across the country. Keeping track of this is mind-boggling. It's changing so fast. It changes every year. Some, they're getting more restrictive. They're getting more um, lenient, and it's in all different ways, and the devil's in the detail. Because all you have to do is say, require a notary for an absentee mail, mail ballot. How many of us are going to go get a notary to cast a ballot absentee by mail? What if you can't leave your house because you're really old? How are you going to get a notary to come to your house to notarize the ballot so they can be small? Um, most of the research before our work was really just focused on the laws. Do the laws make a difference? Does giving people the chance to vote early or vote by mail or automatic voter registration? And what we're really trying to do is combine a measure of election administration with the laws together um, to see how it can make a difference. So um, I was asked, this is the key graph here in our question which is why, what is the reason people give for not voting? And this is, um, this is, this is the census asked this in the current population survey. So this is asked of about 80,000 people every two years. Um, why didn't you vote in the 2020 election? And it's interesting because a big number, 18% said they weren't interested or their vote wasn't going to make a difference. And 15% said they didn't like the candidates, or they didn't like the campaigns. And the campaigns are getting more and more negative, and there's more and more polarization. But a big amount, 13%, said that they were dealing with a family member who had an illness, or they were too busy, they were out of town, they had registration problems. And some big group, almost one in five, just says other. a lot of people who don't vote, and I'll show you what that looks like. Who does vote in this country? Well, um, our, our good friend, Michael McDonald, is a professor down at the University of Florida. He has a website called the U.S. Election Project, 
and it's free. There's no paywalls. You can get all the data. And he has created incredible data philanthropy for all the journalists and everybody who studies election. Um, and just showing you, you know, state by state who voted early, who voted by mail, um, different measures. But in the 2020 election, it was pretty typical. So about 4.5 out of 10 eligible adults. And that means your voting age um, and you're a citizen and you have the right to vote um, actually cast a ballot. So less than, less than one in two of us voted in the 202 midterm. Um, some states have much higher turnout. You can kind of look at the pattern. Iowa in 2020, it's okay. You know, it's in the top half. We're shaded light, shaded light green, but we're not um, in the top states um, in 2020. Colorado shifted to all male voting. They have completely male voting, um, and they are now one of the top states. Washington has all male voting. Um, Oregon has all male voting. It started as a ballot measure in Oregon. I always think about Oregon. Oregon does everything early. Oregon allowed women to vote early, and so did Colorado. Um, and this is kind of the founding of the League of Women Voters. <laughs> um, but so you look at the innovative states, and then in the East Coast, um, Maine is going to use ranked choice voting, and we're going to talk about that later completely. And Alaska uses ranked choice voting. You can come over here and just actually look at the detailed data. So you can see in Iowa, turnout was 51%, which is higher than the national by quite a bit. Let's look at the 2020 election. It was a historic election. It was a crazy election. It was conducted in the height of a pandemic. It, the, pan, the COVID pandemic had only broken out in March. This is November of that same year. We also had a very contested election between Trump and Biden. Um, people were really afraid to vote. I'll show you some data. About 7% of people didn't vote because they just were too afraid to go to the polls. Um, and this turnout there of 66.6% .6 was the highest in a century. Pull us all the way back to the 1900s. And that is what that turnout was. And still, that's only 6.5 out of 10 eligible US adults. I have colleagues who ask, what would happen if 80% of eligible adults voted? What would happen if we really didn't incrementally change it, but shocked it? Like 8 in 10 voted. What, would, what could happen in this country? Um, anyway, um, we'll, we'll come back to this. Now Iowa in 2020 is shaded in the darkest color. Do you see it right here? Um, along with Minnesota and Wisconsin and the same Oregon, Washington, Colorado. Colorado didn't used to be there. I grew up in Colorado. Colorado, oh, it was kind of like the other western states, you know? It was like Wyoming. It was like New Mexico. Colorado with vote centers has really changed. It has become one of the top... Um, turnout states, Florida, high turnout. We also know that there's a lot of inequality in who votes. I'm going to go quickly through this, but this is just by age group. And the gaps in turnout between the young, the, the youngest age group, which is 18 to 29, and the oldest, uh, 65 and over, is really phenomenal. I mean, what, no matter what they say, turnout of young people just hasn't gotten you know, it, it does bump up a little bit, but you can see it's just, it's low. And why this goes like this is because the midterm elections always have about 15% lower turnout than the presidential elections. So you're always going to see this pattern. But, um, but the turnout of young people in this country is a, is a real issue. Education is another big issue. These gaps are gigantic. If you have less than a high school degree, you have about a 30% chance of voting. And if you have a, um, a graduate degree, it's like 90%, 80 to 90. So we have big education gaps. And this is by race, ethnicity. This is just to show you that basically blacks, blacks and white non-Hispanics vote at roughly the same rates in this country. Um, and Latinos and Asian Americans vote at significantly lower rates um, in this country. Um, okay, so one reason why people don't vote is because they can't. 
they have family members who are sick, they are sick, or they don't have time, they're working two jobs, they have young kids. And I'll never forget, Dave and I were in Ohio, and we had three little kids, and I rushed to the polling place. And I got there like 10 minutes before the polling place closed at 8. And it was like, you know, I had worked all day, and I had cooked dinner, and I had taken care of three little kids. And I said, wow, I, I made it. And I thought, this is hard. Like, it was hard to vote. It was hard. Even for somebody who studies voting, it was hard to vote. So let's talk about the shock of the 2020 election, because it did something really crazy. 2020 did something really crazy that we didn't even think about. Most of us probably walk around and go, the pandemic, 2020? Oh, yeah, that was just, just a pain. But it did something actually maybe good for our election system. Well, 7% of people, they say, refrained from voting. We had this historic turnout. It had been 100 years since we had tried to have an election during a pandemic. Obviously, our economy was really badly damaged. We had 15% of people were unemployed. The census reports that one in four Americans, their household has, had either lost their job or lost wages. I mean, it was really an economic, serious shock to this country. Um, and uh, people were afraid of Election Day crowds. And so the states began to innovate. And it was kind of a crazy election. And in 2020, two-thirds of all ballots were cast earlier by mail. Two-thirds. We, and I can show you what it looked like. Because just before that, you know, not too long before, 14% were cast earlier by mail in 2022. Um, it went to 63% in 2020. Um, Actually, 83% of Americans were eligible to cast an absentee mail ballot in 2020. One of the reasons, we're not going to talk about the Iowa caucuses on the Democratic side, but one of the reasons why we don't have a Democratic Iowa caucus is because the DNC insisted that they allow mail voting. And I called Elaine Carmack at Brookings, and I said, she's on the DNC Rules Committee, and this was like two years ago, and I said, what is going on? Yes, I called the power center because I thought, this is serious. I've been studying the Iowa caucuses my whole life. And it had to do with rules. It just had to do with rules. It didn't have to do with Iowans. Now, we can still be upset about the Iowa caucuses. I still think I might be upset about the Iowa caucuses. But it is about rules. Um, in the 2020 election, this is the map of who allowed mail voting. Abs so completely mail ballots or absentee mail ballots. It was Arkansas, Alabama, Kentucky, West Virginia, South Carolina that mm. allowed being afraid of getting COVID as a valid excuse to get an absentee ballot. Um, all the green states, you could just get an absentee ballot for no reason, just request them. That was a huge election for third party groups mailing ballots. Our son was away at college. He must have gotten 20 requests to get an absentee ballot. They just were flooding into our house. Um, and then the yellow states were, were basically using all mail ballots um, in the 2020 election. So this, is a, this was a really dramatic election. But what I want to show you is that it, it had been trending this way. It's kind of like how people buy groceries online now. <laughs> I don't know if you, if you buy groceries online, but... That's something that happened. It was trending this way. COVID hit, and boom, Amazon went huge. Buying groceries online went huge. I think they say that Iowa has some of the highest um, online retail of any of the states in the nation. But look at it grow. This is 216. And it started, the all-mail ballots started there in Oregon in 208 with the ballot measure. Um, so that's part of what I think the, one of the points of this is, is that 2020 was a shock that continued a silent, rev, rev, a silent revolution to try to modernize how we vote. Um, it was starting, and it pushed a whole bunch of states over that wouldn't have allowed mail voting or early voting the way they did, but they did. Um, as I say, Colorado and Oregon are leaders. Um, it's growing. It's very, very complex. I mean, 
I, I can't even begin to tell you exactly all the requirements for notaries or not notaries, how ballots have to be signed and sealed, how they're verified. Mail ballots are really complex. Um, and the U.S. Postal Service became you know, focused on and controversial during the 2020 election because of how important these ballots are. In fact, um, I, Michael Ritter has a paper on the U.S. Postal Service because it, how they deliver first-class mail varies, actually, <laughs> across the country. They have different, like, rates of accuracy. Um, so since 2020, the states have been going in different directions. And former President Trump was really opposed to mail ballots. That was one of his biggest issues. He actually believed that mail ballots were the cause of the fraud. Um, his, our, his belief that there was fraud really started with mail ballots. And there were many lawsuits and challenges in states and, and local governments all across the country regarding mail ballots. Mail ballots. Before 2020, it wasn't controversial at all. It was like brushing your teeth. It was boring. It became something that became really polarizing, but isn't really. Doesn't, isn't really. Um, what happened is because of partisanship, and also, I think, being careful, trying to make, trying to make elections secure and safe. I'd love to hear your feedback on this table, this, this graph, which is, you know, which, sta which states expanded mail voting post tw in 2022, which states restricted, and Iowa's in the restricted category. Can you tell us what Iowa did in 2022? Where do I begin? I mean, is there we a, even started before then. We've shortened the early voting window. I mean, we've started at 40 days, and now we're down to 20 days. 20. Yeah, 15 days to request an absentee ballot. Um, the polls used to be open not for city elections, but general elections till 9. Now it's 8 o'clock at night. So it's just, well, we have now a voter ID. I mean, it's just been a slow kind Can of you repeat it into the process. microphone a little bit? You can stuff this here if you want to look. Oh, here. yeah, that would help me. And I think what's kind of weird about Iowa is our former governor, Branstead, was all about mail voting. Right. And then it turned around when Trump became president. Well, Utah is a mail voting state. And if you go look at which state votes for Republicans more than any state in the nation, it's Utah. So this is why I'm saying it's not, a, it's not really a partisan issue. But it did get some partisan coloring. But also, I think there are concerns. There were concerns about how to make this new thing that we adopted in 2020, the rush of the pandemic, also how to make sure that it was secure and safe. Because if we lose the security of elections, then the whole thing goes down. The whole thing, the thing called democracy, goes down. Um, so you can see the no change. Um, this is how, so overall, and I have to put my glasses on. So um, this is the percentage of validated voters who say they cast a ballot for either Trump or um, Biden. Um, this is, uh, this survey wasn't exactly what the election results look like. But as you can see, um, people, Trump voters had a lot more in-person voting, and yet still, 38% of Trump voters voted by mail. That's a lot. That's almost 4 in 10 Trump voters. But Biden had a lot more mail voting. 6 in 10 Biden voters voted by mail. Um, and they had a lot, he had less um, in-person voting. So this is what we really have. We have in-person on election day, we have in-person early, and we have mail. That's what we are today. We are a hybrid voting system. Um, and then what happened is because of the states making mail voting harder, because of people ever, you know, hearing negative things about mail voting, the campaign about mail voting, you did have in 2022 
smaller shares of people voting by mail, whether they were Democrat or Republican. Do you see it dropping? Um, so, but it's still significant. Um, it's still a, a, a big amount. Okay. So, basically, I've talked about one law, one state law, which is mail voting. I'm going to come back to it because we think mail voting is actually the most important. Our results, our data shows that we think mail voting is the most important of them all. Um, but we are now going to kind of show you some other laws and show you election administration. Automatic voter registration, have you heard of it? Um, very important. Um, we do not have it, but they have basically if you interact with the government, you get a driver's license or in any other way interact with the government, um, you are automatically registered to vote. Hundreds and thousands of people have been added to the voter rolls. Most countries in Europe, if you have a social security number, you're registered to vote or whatever it would be in those countries. Um, we, because of the progressive era, we require a two-step process where you have to register to vote and then cast a ballot. If you move, you have to re-register. Um, and so this is a really um, innovative reform that so far hasn't gotten as much pushback and has spread very rapidly across the, straight, the states in a very small amount of time. Same-day registration allows you to um, register and cast a ballot on the same day. That really helps because, you know, a lot of people don't even know there's an election or they don't care about the election until it's too late to register. In many states, um, you have to register 30 days before an election. That cuts out a ton of people. So SDR, and SDR has been shown to increase turnout. Iowa has a lot of these laws. I was going to tell you, Iowa did vote red, and Iowa has always had good election laws. We've always had same day. I mean, we're with the same day. We're with the mail voting. We're with the early voting. We don't have ABR. Um, this is in-person early voting. The states that allow in-person early voting and the yellow states have now turned to almost all mail voting, completely all mail voting. One thing I just want to show you is the South. The South is much more likely to not have any of these laws, but they have early voting. And it turns out that in-person early voting is really important in the South, especially they've, we have shown for black turnout in the United States. You wouldn't think about it. You wouldn't go, oh, yeah, that early voting, that's the thing. But early voting in the South is very, very important. Um, this is from a survey we did, a big survey with Cornell. It was funded by the National Science Foundation. It was right before the 2022 election. Um, and Julie Pacheco and Fred um, Bemke were my partners on this. But we did not write this question. I just want you to see this question. The process of counting ballots for American elections is trustworthy. I mean, I think that gives me some hope that that number is only 30% who say that it's not trustworthy. Because the difference between 30, that means 60, believe that we are counting ballots in a trustworthy way. Um, and, and part of what I think is interesting is that there is this belief that, that there is fraud, that the mail ballots don't work, and yet at the same time, things are rapidly moving forward. The states are really innovating. Local governments are innovating. We're doing things better and better than ever before. Um, so this comes to what election administration is. This is one metric, not the only, but one very widely used. It's from the MIT Election Lab, and it's called the Election Performance Index. Heather Gerken is a law professor at Yale. She envisioned this, and her idea was, we're going to shame these states that don't do well in conducting elections by having them rank at the lowest, like having them rank 50th. And we're going to sh sh shed positive light on the states that do a good job conducting elections um, and make them be models. So because her idea was, how do, we, how do we encourage something good, like creating better elections? If we look at US News and World Reports, we always want to be the better ranked schools, not the lower ranked schools. So we want to be the better ranked. Um, and Charles Stewart is a professor there. This is back in 2016. This is the election performance index metric back then. Iowa always does well. 
I'm just going to show you. Iowa generally ranks high. Sometimes it ranks very high. But what states rank very low? I'm always struck by the fact that California, which has 40 million people, and right now I believe Gavin Newsom is in China, and he's talking about collaborating with the Chinese government in terms of environmental policy, but they rank very poorly on this one metric. That's, these are things you don't necessarily think about. Um, and yeah, New York, New York and New Jersey do not do well. New York has had a problem. Anyway, it's conducted, it's, we have this metric every two years. Um, and I can show you what's in it. It has 19 different outcomes. Um, it's like, think of it like um, ranking hospitals in terms of uh, how well they take care of their patients. Um, and this is the ranking, I believe this is the most recent, and Iowa is ranked third in the nation for on the 50 state ranking of the election performance index. Colorado ninth, Massachusetts 10th, Wisconsin fourth, Nebraska fifth. Minnesota up here, second. Um, and now you can see who are some of the much lower rated um, states that include New York and California. Um, on the left column are some of the components that go into the election performance index, um, whether they make their data complete, um, the percentage of mail ballots that are rejected, the percentage of mail ballots that aren't returned, the percentage of military and overseas ballots rejected, military and overseas ballots returned, whether they have online registration, post-election audits, provisional ballots cast, all sorts of measures, residual ballots, <laughs> residual ballots we don't want. That means rejected ballots. Um, so these are things we don't want. Um, those are the components that go into the index. On the right is a widely used index called the cost of voting index that basically measures the sum of all these laws. How restrictive are the voter ID laws? Do they have mail voting and all sorts of things? So these are two different indices that are widely used. How was it developed? Um, and you can, you can read about it, but um, it includes a lot of practitioners, but they say they want to update this index now and do it better. Um, and so, this is how the states look on this index. One pattern we see is darker means better here. Washington and Montana and those states do really well. But you can see that over time, the states are doing better in general in conducting elections. The pattern is over time, more darker states. Darker means we're, we're conducting elections better, even though 30% of people think that the election wasn't counted correctly, but we we're, we're, but scientific measures show that we're actually med doing better. This is where um, the laws are the most restrictive to vote. Here, darker shades are worse. Um, so states with the darking, darker shaded are more restrictive laws. Michigan is, is shaded dark. We don't think of that, do we? Do we think of Michigan? Governor, how do we pronounce? Gret, Gretchen? Gretchen? We don't think of Michigan as having restrictive voting laws. Huh. Hmm, but they do. Um, so these are part of what we can do with data. So we're going to come back to this map, which is what I showed you at the beginning. To us, the, like a picture that says a thousand words, how do we get every county to be dark purple, which means the highest and best election administration on this one index and the highest voter turnout in the last election. This table I know looks ugly to you because this is the kind of world that we live in where we use multivariate regression. So just, I'm just going to say the words. I'm going to tell you what these numbers mean. Um, we do not use survey data. We, we use now the national voter files, which is the accumulation of all 50 state voter files voter files. This is because if you ask people whether they vote in surveys, do they tell you the truth? No. Because there's something called social desirability bias, which is that people want to look like they're good people. So voting is supposed to be something that goes with a good citizen. And so people say they vote even when they don't. So switching over to actually using the national voter files has been a huge change um, in how people study elections and voter turnout. 
And here we're looking at turnout in the 218 election. And a big thing is we're including, we're trying to predict who voted in the 218 election, and we're including whether they voted in 214. This is like a pre-post test. This would be like when you go to the physical therapist right after surgery and two months after surgery. You're hoping to look better after two months after surgery than right after surgery. And so we're, we're modeling the change in how likely somebody is to vote in midterm elections. And basically, this says that if you live in a state that has better election administration, you're more likely to vote in every case um, in midterm elections. If you live in a state that has early voting, you're about four percentage points more likely to vote in midterm elections and the 218. If you live in a state with male voting in 218 pre-COVID, you were 10% more likely to vote, 10%. If somebody said, if you brush your teeth, you have a 10% reduced likelihood of a cavity. Would that be enough for you? I, I would probably brush my teeth. I mean, that's, that's pretty good. 10% is a pretty good. Same day registration increases your probability of being able to cast a vote by about 5.5%. Automatic voter registration, about 5.5%. Um, and then having more restrictive laws reduces your probability of voting. We're controlling for a huge battery of things like your, your, all the demographics, your age, your education, your race, um, your, your partisanship, your ideology. But this is the big one. This was the 2020 election that I told you about, the shock, the, the crazy election. And here, now we're predicting voting in the 2020 election and controlling for whether someone voted in the 2016 election. Again, we're modeling change, but change in presidential elections within the same person. And if you live in a state with male or male voting, you had a 23% increased probability of voting. No other law had such a big impact in being able to cast a ballot in 2020 as mail voting ballots. Um, whereas same day registration helped, automatic voter registration helped, um, early voting even helped by 5%. But mail voting helped the most. Um, and our sample size, I don't know if you can see, it's about 2.5 million people. We're using the 1% file. For us, we're trying to look at the laws together with the election administration. We're trying to use the best data possible. We're trying to use the best modeling possible. And from our research, we think mail voting, mail voting, as controversial and everything else, is the biggest game changer for changing turnout. Um, this is from the Democracy Fund. This is Piero Midier's money. So. Um, if you think about our robber barons today, what do they do? Well, they create the Democracy Fund, and the Democracy Fund gives money to people who are trying to study how to make democracy better, including journalism. They fund journalism, too. But every eligible citizen should have an equal opportunity to participate in elections that are free and fair, as well as efficient and secure. And so implementing accessible and trustworthy elections is an immense undertaking, but the American election system is also challenged by persistent barriers to voting, um, by excluded communities, and faces new threats. We got our book at title, Accessible Elections, from this. OK, that's our little answer. I go like this. If you could do it, if you could make a, if for you, the League of Women Voters, you're into recommendations, fund local election administration so that we have quality local election administration, all these components, and add this system of laws, AVR, SDR, early voting, mail voting, combined, we think that that's like the framework that we need to take this, it's not quite a dinosaur, but it's a little bit of a dinosaur um, of an election system and modernize it for this um, current system. Okay, last thing, really, really quick, because I, I don't have any time. But why don't people vote? Because they're not interested and they don't like the candidates. We come back to this graph, those top two. Um, and one of the problems we have right now is about 45% of Americans are independents, according to Gallup. They, they do not affiliate with the Democrat or the Republican Party. They call themselves independents. And it's... It varies between 40 and 45. It's really high. It's really high among young people. It's really high among racial and ethnic minorities. Um, and if you're under 50, you know, 3 in 10 don't affiliate with one of these two parties. Um, and you can look, 
Um, do you do about a quarter of Americans say that neither party represents them at all? And you really see this among Democrats who lean, who are independents but lean Democrat. Those might even be the very liberal young people, um, libertarians who are Republicans or independents lean Republican. Um, it's growing. Um, if you look at this data from 2018 to 2020, the percentage of people who just feel like the candidates don't rep represent their views, they don't represent who they are, is growing. Um, I, th I, I think it's a real problem. Um, and this is just showing that if you feel underrepresented by either party, you're, you have way more negative views um, about the political system, about elected officials, and whether or not your vote matters. So people who are independents are much, you know, are less likely to vote. They have less confidence in the political system. Um, they're the black dot going down. And they're the ones, half of them wish there were more political parties. 50% of people who are independents want more political parties. Um, in many countries in the world, they have more political parties. Um, so here's another little teeny small thing. We talked, talked about the ballot, the mail ballot vote, the mail ballot. But here's another one. Have you guys heard of ranked choice voting? You've heard of ranked choice voting? OK, well, then I might not even need to educate you guys on this. But basically, one thing about our competitive campaigns is that the, the attack ads and the negative campaigns is just crazy. And the money that's spent on these negative ads is unbelievable. Um, and this can turn off voters. A lot of people are just like, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Like, if that's, if that's what politics is, I don't want to be part of that. Um, and so we have done quite a bit of research. I'm really glad Sam Harper is sitting here in the back row with the white shirt because he has um, helped us co-author two papers on ranked choice voting that just have come out in the last couple of years. Um, but ranked choice voting is actually a really s simple change again. It's just a ballot design change, which um, is called instant runoff voting. Um, and instead of casting a vote for just your most preferred choice, you rank them one, two, three. And so, um, and we do this all the time. So if we vote, ask for classes, we have to give our choices, you know, one, two, three. Um, it's in sports all the time. Basically, it's how it works is all you're doing is just ranking the candidates one, two, three. Um, if a candidate wins a majority of the votes, they never even look at the second and third place votes. That person is just declared the winner. Um, but if the top candidate receives a plurality but not a majority, then they basically take the candidate with the least votes, eliminate that person, and redistribute that voter's votes to whoever they voted for second place. It means, we do this in the Democratic Iowa caucuses. They, you, they do this, because we have two rounds of voting. So your first time, I'll just expose Eddie. Our son, Ed, was uh, one of those, they called them, did they call them the Yang gang? The young people who liked Andrew Yang. He liked Andrew Yang. So he caucused for Andrew Yang. But of course, Andrew Yang was not viable in the first round. So then he had to go find a viable candidate for the second round. But he had two votes. He could express his true preferences. He could show up at the caucuses and have somebody to vote for. Um, so in the similar way, in the Democratic, they've done quite a few surveys. And actually, Elizabeth Warren would have probably won and nationwide had ranked choice voting been in place, she was a compromise candidate. She got a lot of second place votes. You know, people who voted for Bernie first could vote for her second. People who voted for, a lot of people could vote for her somewhere in that range. She didn't win, but she was a compromise candidate. She was like a coalition candidate. Um, I always use the ice cream shop because I love ice cream. It's like a major part of how I live. But if I went to the ice cream store and I said, do you have any chocolate ice cream? And they said, no, you have no chocolate. I would say, well, then do you have strawberry? And if they said, no, I had no strawberry, I would say, well, I'll take vanilla. Because I'd rather have something than no ice cream. And so, you know, this is this idea that we use this all the time. Um, in the the I, moderates, independents, and people who are disaffected could 
could, it, this may be a game changer for them because they could vote for third party candidates and not feel like they're throwing out their ballot. So what are the potential benefits? You can save money. This is a big, I was just on a call with the, the, the auditors from Utah and Republican state. They love this, ranked choice voting. Why? Because it saves so much money. Because you're folding the, the, the regular election and the runoff into one election. Um, you don't have this spoiler effect where the, the most, the least preferred candidate wins. And this is really, this is a big deal in American politics. Ralph Nader in the 20, 2000, 2000 election allowed George W. Bush, no, to win over, he got 3% of the vote to win over yeah, Al Gore. Um, Bill Clinton would not have been president if, if we didn't have the spoiler effect because Perot got 19% of the vote, 19%. Um, right now in presidential elections, people are so afraid of third parties. Don't vote. Don't even run. And yet third parties may show up in the 2024 election. And under our current system, the whole thing breaks. Um, and more thing, our research is suggesting, though, that it might increase turnout and it might mobilize people because when you have more candidates, they, they reach out to more people, more people get interested. But this is really the key to some of our early work is that it really encourages more civility, and we have, an, we have published articles showing this. And this is because in candidates go negative on their opponent. Oh, and they go more and more negative and they hire campaign consultants to make the worst ads possible. But in a ranked choice voting election, you can win with second place votes. So you have an ins candidates have an incentive not to go negative on the opponent because they want to say, hey, I know you're going to vote for that person first, but hey, keep me second. And that moderation, this idea of winning with second and third place votes is really important. It's like changing the game. And our research has shown that it may de-escalate divisive politics. Both candidates and citizens um, can s feel like elections are less polarizing in places that use ranked choice voting. It's now used statewide in Maine and Alaska. You might think those are pretty different states. They are pretty different states, but they both adopted um, ranked choice voting. New York City used it um, in the mayoral contest. And I'm from Boulder, Colorado, and they are having their first mayor's election with ranked choice voting right now, this fall. Um, and so it's um, increasing use. So I come back to this, and thank you so much. Oh, and I use too much time. If I understand correctly, you've drawn the conclusion that mail-in ballots will cause people to vote who otherwise would not have voted. Is that correct? We have evidence that mail-in ballots increase turnout. Okay. How do you control or consider political rhetoric in the conclusions that you're drawing, especially around the 2020 election? where the uh, dominant narratives about the election were much more um, in the public conscience, conscious than previously. Say that. Say that. So a lot more people knew and thought about the 2020 election. Right. Right. Good question. I did not show you, but re we replicate these exact models um, for 2022, and we get very similar results. I, I, I promise you I stared at these data and flipped them upside and down as if it were a salt shaker for so long, and it is the most powerful of the laws is the male voting. 
absent, no excuse absentee or all male. And it doesn't really matter um, which one, but yeah. Yeah, I wonder what it would take to change that rhetoric is what maybe you're suggesting. Who, how, and why. Yeah. yeah. That's a great question. <laughs> so the youth vote um, and mail in ballot. So, so if it's mail in or whatever the criteria is across the entire spectrum of voters, is there, and that may hold for the youth as well as 60 plus across all age demographics. But is there, is there something else, or is, is, do the youth and their percentage of engagement um, change on some other um, attribute um, nearly as much as mail-in ballot? Bal what would be a step change beyond just the mail-in or, or that from a, from a get more youth to engage? Well, so the... the um Pennsylvania Senate race, and I'm not going to get his name right. So, Sam? Uh, John Fetterman and Ed Oz. Mm -hmm. John Fetterman. He just wouldn't have won without that youth vote. That youth vote in Pennsylvania was, an, was really amazing. It was significant. It was big. It, it turned the tables. In fact, everybody's talking about the youth vote in 2024. The whole thing is about the youth vote. And the youth vote, the youth vote is about the election laws. We're all affected by the election laws. I mean, and when you're away at college, if you have the option to cast a mail ballot, that works. When you're not, that's harder. Um, so it's a candidate. And, John, and Fetterman was really a candidate who young people could feel connected to. I mean, he, he wore sweats. He think he just got kicked down to the Senate for wearing sweats. I mean, he's really, like, he just says, I'm not going to be like you guys. I'm not going to, I'm going to be a totally different kind of candidate. Um, yeah. So I feel like the youth vote has to do a lot with this second part. Like, how do you get people to be interested and to care? And what kind of candidates are those? And we can see it locally. Um, but nationally, we haven't seen it as much. So do you see, do you see you, have you done any studies to say that the farther you get away from, the farther you get away from local politics, the less engaged youth are? And the closer you are to local politics, the more engaged youth are? Is it backwards? Is there no, no, poor local politics has the worst turnout. The lowest, the lowest. It's, it's so sad. And primaries, average turnout in primaries is 20%. And in many of these primaries where some of the more extreme candidates are in the House, they, had, they won with 10% turnout. Um, and Joseph Call is a former uh, University of Iowa um, PhD, and he's at the College of Worcester, and he and Courtney Jurek have done quite a bit of research on young people, and they show young people are really affected by these election laws, like even more than other groups. Anybody who is if you know, like iffy on voting, they're more um, these laws, whether they're ex, you know accessible or restrictive, hurt them more. Yeah. Say your name. You're in our my the public policy class, I think, right? Andrea. Andrea, thank you. We haven't studied voting and election laws yet, but we have been studying a lot of stuff, right? If anybody else needs to sign, here's the piece of paper. Okay, thank you. Has there been any work towards um, completely online voting? Um, they allow um, over overseas. Oh. Yeah, yeah, they, they do allow over, military and overseas voting online. But um, Mike Alvarez, who's at Caltech, has done a lot of research on that. Um, I mean, they allow it for military and overseas, so, I mean, it's got to be secure enough. 
but like your question is, well, why don't we have it? Do you want to give an answer to that? Yeah, I was actually just at DEF CON where it's a bunch of hackers, and they're still at the stage where they just don't feel it's safe. I mean, the hackers could still get into... I'm sorry, the hackers could still get into the systems. I mean, you know, when you look, you know, hackers right now are getting into the FBI system, you know, they... Yeah. The anonymous folks can hack into our top government databases. Who's to say they wouldn't get into these databases and really mess with things at this point? So yeah. I think it's a long ways off, unfortunately. Yeah. It's not something I've studied, um, but I know them who do that. Yeah. Does your uh, research show any new insights into why the American political or election system isn't revered more or respected more. Does that figure at the end of your graph? Was that 40% or was that 60 Six, 30 percent were worried that the election wasn't accurate. So that would, that would leave 70 percent think we're OK. Um, could, Confidence in the U.S. election system was way higher before Trump. This is just, I, it just was. We have survey after survey. This was something very unique to, to, to this presidency and this time period. As I said, it's an envelope. Mail ballots. Envelope. You know, yeah, it's interesting. How does America stand in relationship to other nations around the world in terms of voter turnout, voter participation? It is higher in, in it, it's been going down though, um, in, in all countries in the world, uh, democratic countries. They don't allow, listen to this, they don't allow mail voting at all in France. They don't allow in-person early voting, but guess what? They allow proxy voting. Like you could vote for me. Or you could vote for me. We would never allow <laughs> proxy voting. And they don't allow mail voting or early voting. So just looking at the other countries in the world is really interesting. Um, but we're, you know, us at our best, 66.6, .6, that's kind of like a typical French election. 60 in the 60s is them. Us in our worst is worse than them. Um, I'm talking Europe when I say them. Yeah. Well, speaking of international, is there anything that's used internationally that was not on your list? And I'm thinking of, you know, election day holiday, compulsory oh, yeah. voting, anything like that that yeah, I love is, that. should be experimented with. That compulsory voting, you get a ticket. You get fined if you don't vote in all of these um, Scandinavian countries, basically. It's not like you're going to go to jail. But I mean, it's not probably like you even care to pay maybe that much of the little ticket. But the idea that it's like a requirement, if you're going to be a citizen, you should have to vote. Um, actually, the ranked choice voting comes from Aust Australia. They, they use it. And so does Ireland. Um, other countries in the U, they just call it, they don't call it ranked choice voting, they call it the alt alternative, alternative vote or something. Um, and then of course an election day holiday is very widely, you, that's very widely used in other countries of the world. The idea that if we care about our democracy, we should really make that be important. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of roles. Of course, most countries would use a proportional elect electoral system and would have multiple parties. Um, and so we're very unusual. Um, and most no countries have an electoral college. None. None in the whole world have an electoral college. Those, the founding fathers came up with that in 1787. And they were trying to kind of deal with conflicts, but again, the electoral college is, you know, very unique. A bicameral, con a bicameral Congress is very unique. Most countries have a parliament. 
So I always talk about, like, you know how marsupials are in Australia and New Zealand? It's like they're perfectly good animals. Like, they just look different. That's like us. We're the marsupials. We just look different. You know, we have different rules. We're still like a good country. Anyway, but yeah, there's a whole layers of them. In fact, I will quit plugging former University of Iowa students, but Dan Bowen is one of our former University of Iowa students. He's at the College of New Jersey. His entire research is on redistricting, you know, like the nonpartisan redistricting and how to make redistricting not gerrymandered, and on smaller legislative constituency size. And in many places like California, the state Senate, there's more people than in the US House. There's a million people for every state senator in California. And his research shows that legislative districts should be small. We need to add seats everywhere, especially to the US House and the Senate. So yeah, so I guess that question, that's a complex question. There's layers all over this. Term limits, too. Uh, I had two questions. Um, are there specific laws or educational opportunities that operate better in like dense urban communities uh, at a local level in comparison to like rural or suburban areas? Those are great questions, actually, because conducting elections is harder in urban areas. Do you want to say anything about that? No. No. I mean, yeah, it's just. It's harder. Yeah, way harder. I mean, it's, our, our metrics show they do worse. Yeah. Is it still mailbox voting Well, probably because it would get rid of the crowds. Yeah, I was going to say here, just in Johnson County, like Iowa City, we have uh, early voting coming up where you can vote here at the library. That drives a lot more people than absentee when you can come out on a Saturday or a Sunday instead of going to our office, but that's still considered voting absentee or early voting. But that really, like you just mentioned, it drives down the lines on election day. Yeah. Um, and I do, so I, yeah. I mean, I, I'm just telling you, it, the really big urban areas have a harder time conducting elections. Just like if you got in trouble and you needed to go to the hospital, you'd be better off going to the hospital here in Iowa City than you would be in a big urban area. Yeah. Wow. How? What was that? Do you remember? Uh, I don't know. I don't yeah. Know, but... That was a really important race, and it still has ramifications right now, and more ramifications because they have a huge refugee population that's coming into Chicago. So yeah, great questions. Um, I have a question about mail-in voting, because you've made a really strong case for how important it is for it to be adopted. And I can think of all sorts of groups, like disability rights organizations or AARP, who would want mail-in voting, because otherwise some people, and I've met lots of older people, who find it impossible to get to the polls. So my question is, I mean, I, I can think of a lot of people who want it, so who who... Who doesn't? Why don't they? I mean, so what's the pushback against it? The pushback is not secure. The pushback is, you know, the the argument that that it could, you know, your ballots could get lost, that somebody could be watching you mo vote at home and change your ballot f or cast a ballot for you, or the Postal Service could break into your ballot or all, all these. And what's really interesting is that, you know, in Florida and in Arizona, that had a lot of Trump supporters, there was high mail ballots, high, for the reasons you mentioned, the mm -hmm. older and the disabled, yeah. So, but that you may you raise a really good point, which is like, where do you find friends to try to advocate for mail voting? Well, that would be good. If I went to DC, it would be good if I could ever give a presentation for the AARP. Maybe I should go ask them. Hey, <laughs> will you let me have a? <laughs> will you let me come talk to you? Let's.
You just listed off several allegations of how mail-in voting and, is. And, and I probably don't know. Please take, I do not know. No, but I, I only I, read in the news. I don't I know, know anything. But, um, the question is, is there any evidence that those things are taking place? Remember back in Iowa a few elections ago, there was a concern about people voting who shouldn't be voting, mm -hmm. or they were voting for someone else, and we went, we hired one of the former uh, mm -hmm. head of the, in the Department of Criminal Investigation at over $100,000 to go and find all these illegal voters, and I think mm -hmm. he came up with five or six. Yeah. So, that, I mean, there there was the one Republican congressional district in. Polk County had a double voter. That, but the, but the, but not in Iowa. It was in a southern state. There was one that had, but it was the the candidate, the Republican candidate. There was some problems, but no, there the the kind of this that's the evidence. It's not there. We don't we don't have. Good evidence on um, that there's consistent. So there's no evidence yet. Not good evidence that I know of. Do we have time for one more? Okay. You guys have been a great audience. Those are great questions. Thank you. Well, since there's time for one, one more, and maybe it's just because I'm from there, but on the map that was your previous one. I noticed how well a lot of it, and I'm thinking of like uh, American nations or these things, these like discussions about regionalism, and how well some of those seem to overlap, except South Dakota. Like it's notable to me that like Nebraska and Minnesota and North Dakota are all similar in that like lovely purple, and then there's South Dakota in the middle there. So I'm just curious kind of what's going on there. Sam, could you answer that? Because I couldn't. Hi, I'm uh, one of Carolyn's grad students. Um, my understanding for South Dakota in particular is there's a combination of um, a, so there's a large Native American population that, um, that makes it a little more difficult to, for the state to run elections because most things have to be coordinated with the, uh, so there's an extra layer of government there, right? So that accounts for about a quarter of uh, South Dakota, not, not a quarter of South Dakota's population, like 10% of South Dakota's population, like half of South Dakota's land area because it's, you know, the Sioux Nation still has a, a large though diminished reservation. And then um, otherwise, I mean, some of this stuff is, uh, diff I mean, sometimes just things happen at state levels and we can't quite predict them. Um, I mean, if you look, you know, why South Dakota versus North Dakota, North Dakota is the only state without voter rolls, right? I mean, they have lists of voters, but you don't even have to be registered in North Dakota to vote. They're the only state that's like that. Um, so it's part historical happenstance, but part there is this like extra layer of government and some of alleged um, discrimination against um, the, that you know set of people there because Native Americans generally vote for the Democratic Party, uh, which is not the majority party in South Dakota. Um, so there are, you know, it's multifaceted, but also a good chunk of it is just, you know, we don't we, we don't know exactly. And here's one thing that goes with that. Thanks, Sam, for saying that. I just um, we have a Taylor um, Taylor Tacos is in our department, and she studies Native American turnout. It's something that has not been studied at all. And a new article was just published showing that states that require voter ID, that Native American Indians who live on reservations have a much harder time getting um, an ID because you have to show a mailing address. And on the reservations, they don't have like an, a house number. So it's harder to get the ID, and the states require voter ID to vote. And so that could be part of it, too. So complex. It's complex. Thanks so much. Lovely. We have a very special gift, a gift for you tonight for preparing this wonderful lecture, which really was. Thank you very okay. much.